Hello everyone, my name is Anne and you are watching Art on the Creek. This is our little dog Leo and he is here to wish you a very happy Valentine's Day. Let's go paint Leo today, shall we? Well, you can probably hear it in my voice still. I do have a cold, and um, so we're going to try and get through this without <laughs> too many interruptions. Oh my goodness, I appreciate your patience. I'm going to include a link to Leo's photo today, as well as uh, a link to a PDF drawing that I have for you. Both of those will be on Dropbox. My drawing is just a little bit off, and I decided to go ahead and go with it. I think it's, it's skewed to the right a little bit, but... I was done messing with it and like I said I have a cold and I really don't feel 100% so I just wanted to get painting. Uh, the brushes we're going to be using today are kind of fun. I have a, a Da Vinci Cassiano number 10 and also a Da Vinci Cosmo top. These brushes are a little bit different than um, what I normally use but uh, for rendering fur I think they will really do a great job. I decided to go ahead and include this in the beginner lesson, but we're going to be doing it just a little bit different than the other lessons in the series. Um, starting off with some cerulean blue. Now this set of paints I have here is kind of a mix of different brands. Um, but basically, if you're going to work on a dog nose, what I can tell you is to start with blue. I like to use cerulean because that's really the color um, that it's going to reflect from the sky. If you don't have cerulean or a manganese blue, you can definitely go in with the uh, um, French ultramarine or some other blue like that. Just make sure you go in with a really light wash. And you can see I kind of lifted off a little bit there uh, toward the left because that's where the light source is coming from. Although this is very muted, it's not really uh, not really a super brightly lit photo. Uh, so the lighting in this can be subtle. You can make it pretty much however you like. If you do not have a buff titanium, um, I do recommend getting one because it's a really great paint to add to your palette. Um, and you can see in my palette there, I fit some half pans in sideways. So that's another tip for you. If you think your palette is full, maybe you can squeeze some more paints in there somehow. <laughs> so the buff titanium I'm using is actually a Daniel Smith, but just about anyone will work fine um, if you've got one of these fawn colored dogs. Um, if you don't have buff titanium and you'd like to use something else, I would go with a Van Dyke Brown or a Burnt Umber and just go on with a very, very thin wash. You could use some of your Chinese white and add to that to bring it up a little bit in tone um, and then just uh, keep it really light. The darker color that I'm going in with here is Payne's Gray. Just about everyone has that one. I know that it's in the Paul Rubens set that I recommend, but I'm not certain. I don't think it's in the Winsor Newton set. What you can do is you can mix your own Payne's Gray really very easily. I would just say to mix a little bit of your uh, French ultramarine blue with a touch of that ivory black that's in there. And you, what you're looking for is just a gray that leans a little bit blue. You can also mix an indigo that way. I would use your, your thalo and your black if you needed to mix an indigo, um, just parenthetically, that's kind of fun to know. But what I'm doing now is just kind of going in with this Cosmotop brush again. I haven't used the Cassiano yet. And I'm just filling in little bits and pieces of fur here that are uh, a little bit darker on Leo. And right now he's just kind of kind of look a little patchworky and a little bit messy, but everything will go together. The paper that I'm using, by the way, is a mixed media paper. It is not 100% cotton. And I wanted to do this intentionally for you guys today because I know a lot of beginners out there maybe feel like purchasing cotton paper is just a little bit too precious. I have a couple of favorite cotton watercolor papers out there that are really quite affordable and work very well. Uh, one of them is by Paul Rubens and the other one is by B, uh, Aqua B. Um, and I will link to those in the description. Aqua B is made by Royal Brush Company, Royal and Langnickel. 
And this happens to also be an Aqua B product. It is their mixed media journal, and I really, really am enjoying this paper. So I wanted to go ahead and try something on mixed media here because I wanted you to have an opportunity to see about how much paint I am using when I use a paper that's not 100% cotton, in this case, when I really don't want those cauliflower booms to show up. This particular uh, paper and with these brushes, um, I found it to be a really nice combo for painting animals. The um, the brushes that I'm using, like I said, are a Da Vinci Cosmotop Mix B, and this particular brush is a really interesting makeup. Now, of course, I recommend that you use whichever brush you like, and in fact, if you're a beginner, I like a brush with a good amount of feedback, and if you're looking for a professional brush and you don't need something vegan, this one I do recommend. It's a combination of Sable, Squirrel, Fitch, and a synthetic mix. It's really a nice, nice brush, and it does give you some good feedback. It's got a little bit of resistance. That's what I mean by feedback. When you're working with, for instance, the one I always like to compare it to is the um, the Silver Black Velvet series. That is so soft, and it just kind of melts into the paper. If you have a very delicate hand and um, you don't need that, resistance, that feedback, kind of like if you're <laughs> driving a car with power steering versus non-power steering. For those of you who are old enough to remember that struggle, uh, if you enjoy that feedback, then working with a brush that has those man-made filaments can tend to be a little bit better. Um, just that uh, silver black velvet, those I believe are synthetic squirrel. I'll have to check for sure, but at any rate, those uh, have very little feedback and they just really need an awful lot of control. Uh, I have found that using a brush that is a mix like this is very, very easy uh, to use and a good way to render fur. You'll see what I'm doing with this brush. Now this particular one is a round number six and I am just using it to splay those filaments out on my palette there, creating little hair-like ends and I'm just painting on little strokes of fur. Around the eyes, let's see, I've gone in with a burnt sienna. This is kind of, I've just mixed that uh, Payne's gray into the browns that I have on my palette there. So you can see on my palette on the very top, I've got the buff titanium. And then in this middle area I'm working from now, I have that grayish brown mix, which is the Payne's gray mixed with the uh, burnt umber and just a touch of that burnt sienna. And then right under that, there's a little bit of the cerulean blue that I used for his nose. So right away you can see how easy it is to just go in with this fairly dry brush and that means that there's not an awful lot of moisture in there there's not an awful lot of water in these filaments i am picking up the paint and um, i'm applying it but i'm really going in with mostly the tips of the brush there just so that we can put these fur strokes on here and really get some personality into Leo's fur. Now, when you are painting your pup or your cat, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you are going in the direction of the fur. Of course, that applies to guinea pigs, whatever your pet may be. <laughs> you just always wanna go in that direction of the fur. Now, here is something that I actually regretted doing and I had forgotten that I was working on uh, non-cotton paper. This is uh, something that you wanna be, be careful of I used a staining pigment. I went in there with uh, this red, which is a quinacridone rose. And then I realized that I wanted to lift it off and change that a little bit. And you can see right away it stained the paper and hung on to where I initially put down that brush. It's not going to be a deal breaker when it's all said and done, but it's okay. Um, just be aware of that, that if you're using paper content, watercolor paper or wood pulp, and uh, you wanna go in and lift something off, staining pigments will really grab on quickly. They can lift off of cotton paper um, a little bit better, but not, not very well even there. So just be aware of your staining pigments. So what I went over it with was one of my favorite colors by Holbein, it's a Scarlet Lake. This is such a beautiful corally red, and I thought it would capture the red in Leo's bandana really nicely. And now I'm going over and mixing back in some of that uh, quinacridone rose and just really trying to blend those two colors in. The quinacridone is really kind of a nice pinky, but quinacridones have this underlying gold to them. At least that's the way I see it. All the quinacridone, the purple, the quinacridone gold, quinacridone red, they all have an underlying warmth to them that just makes them really vibrant. They're very light, fast, really nice, nice paints to have, but they can have a tendency to stain. Um, as this one did here, which is fine. And uh, we're just gonna kind of blend. And now I will lift off on that uh, side of the bandana where it's a little bit lighter. And you can kind of still see that initial lay down of color there. But again, if something like this happens to you in your painting, 
don't fuss over it. Just keep going. It there it will be. It's going to look different when it dries. Number one and number two, you can probably change it up. So don't worry about a thing unless it's in a place where you really, really don't want it. Then sometimes when you have a staining pigment, you're kind of stuck and you do have to uh, you do have to just start over. But in this case, we were able to work around it. Uh, going back in and working on Leo's fur here while we're letting the, his kerchief dry. And now I'm going to go into the uh, the Payne's Gray, and I've switched over to the Cassiano brush. This is a number 10 by Da Vinci. These are so fun to use. Now, the Cassiano range is synthetic squirrel. So if uh, having a vegan paintbrush is something that is uh, important to you to have animal-friendly art supplies, then you might consider the Cassiano line. I really like these watercolor brushes. Like I said, they're synthetic squirrel, a Kazan squirrel, and um, vegan, animal friendly. They have a full line of shapes and sizes, but this particular one, this needle point, I really, really love it. It's, um, it's just so unique and so fun to use. I really prefer this to uh, your typical rigger or fine liner because that belly around there that comes out before the needle. Let me put a close up picture of this here so you can see what I mean. Now here it is and we'll zoom in a little bit so you can see just how much belly you have of a reservoir of paint before it gets into the liner portion. And unfortunately here you can also see where the tip of mine has kind of frayed. Um, I'll work on that with some conditioner after I'm done doing this voice over here and then I might have to give it a little trim but I think I should be able to revive that. The brush conditioner that I always recommend is uh, Master's Touch. It's uh, just a little solid cake of soap that's kept in a jar and a plastic jar, and you can easily clean your brushes with it. Even if you're using watercolor br brushes, I definitely recommend cleaning them out with a soap that'll help condition and extend the life of your brushes. So I'm using this wonderful brush here, this uh, this inlaid long liner, the needle point, uh, several, goes by several names, the brush that goes by several names. <laughs> and you'll be able to see here how fun it is to use. I'm gonna go into that Payne's Gray, collect a little bit more of the pigment and watch how easy it is to go around these eyes here. And actually how that uh, tip of it is kind of frayed out a little bit. That's actually working to my advantage at this particular moment because I'm getting uh, several lines laid down at once for his little eyelashes. So especially on this one here, you can really see it. It just, it worked out really well. So I think what I'm going to do is definitely just, I'll clean it with the, the Maestro brush cleaner and uh, we'll go from there and see if I can if I can get it to, to go back to its needlepoint state. At any rate, um, I've gone around the eyes with the Payne's Gray and we're just going to rinse this off a little bit here and let's see where we're going to go next. I'm going to go back into this gray mix that we've got and I'm just pulling some of these uh, fur texture and tones up to kind of add some uh, shape and dimension to, to Leo's face. Whenever you're working on a dog that, or a cat for that matter, like a Persian cat or a dog that has longer hair, think of painting the fur in sections rather than each individual strand of fur. When you do get to that point where you do want to paint individual strands, use a very, very fine brush or um, some kind of uh, way to splay your filaments out so that you really can get that hairline texture. You don't want it to look like wet spaghetti. Um, and it's very easy to do if you've started with uh, a number six round, let's say, and you just kept using that one. Um, it would be very easy to have your long haired animal look as if they've got spaghetti hair or wet hair. So lots of ways to, to render animal fur. Um, one of the easiest to follow artists out there, in fact, she's a fellow Coloradan. She lives in Arvada, which is the city where I Grew up after we left Denver. It's one of the suburbs to the northwest of Denver, and um, her name is Emily Olson. You, many of you are probably familiar with her or already follow her, but she has a really great video for rendering animal fur, and her style is a little bit different than mine. But um, I will put a little card up there in the corner here if you're really interested. If you have a dog that doesn't quite look like Leo, <laughs> fur wise, or your cat is a short haired cat or something like that, I do recommend um, Emily Olson for uh, studying different types of fur. And she's got a great video there. So go and check that one out when you're done with this video here. Let's see, now we're gonna go into his eyes. Now Leo's eyes are just very, very dark. So I'm taking some liberty because luckily I know what his eyes look like, but in the photo, they're just very, very dark. So let me walk you through what's happening here. Um, still using the same uh, long point needle round. I am going in with a thin wash of burnt sienna. It's not too, too thin, but I'm leaving 
space for the highlights. That's kind of important. You want to remember to leave those highlight spaces. Um, if you forget it, don't worry. You can always go back in and adjust because, you know, life is forgiving. It's too short to, to worry about not leaving a highlight in the, in the eye. If you forget it, it's fine. Um, you can go back and fix that later. But when you are working on the eyes, you want to be very careful to let them dry completely. So you'll notice I'm going back and I'm putting some more texture on the nose. And I've moved back to the number six brush here, the number six round. And that one is the uh, the Cosmotop B Mix, Mix B rather. And I've splayed out those filaments and I'm just kind of brushing over the surface lightly because dogs' noses are very, very textured. And I wanted to be able to replicate that in uh, in the painting here. So now I'm going in and I'm lifting off some of the color where I have too much and you'll be able to see here how it brings the shape back to his nose. I'm just kind of with my brush wet and then blotted off on a towel. I'm just going in and painting without adding any paint and that is how you lift something off. You get your brush wet, you blot it off and then you run that damp brush over whatever it is you want to lift. If you need to lift it some more than just this, you can go in and blot it with a paper towel and that will help to lift off even more color. So I think I'm gonna do that, in fact, on the nose here later so you'll be able to see that. But now let's go in. I've got a little bit uh, more of this burnt umber and I'm mixing it with Payne's Gray. Now that the eyes have dried and make sure they are dry, I'm gonna go in and add a little bit of a darker brown around the irises. Now, you might say, why go in with that burnt sienna first when you're just gonna go in with the darker brown and paint over it? And that is an excellent question. With watercolor, we have this great advantage that we are working with a transparent medium, a translucent medium, in fact. So what happens when we look at something that's watercolor? The reason that so much light looks like it's coming from it is because in fact it is. The light that we see bounces back to the surface of the paper and bounces back to our eyes through those translucent colors, through those watercolors. So that's why we see such vibrancy when we look at a watercolor painting. What we're seeing when we're going to look at Leo's eyes when they're done, we will see that layer of burnt sienna through the layer of burnt umber, and that will create a nice little glow to his eyes. Now at this point, if you are at all nervous about this, wait until it's completely dry or use a heat tool before you go in and do these pupils. But I've just dropped in some Payne's Gray for the pupil and then um, kind of swiped off a little bit on the bottom to help shape it. And now we're gonna go in with that heat tool and make sure everything is completely dry. Now that he is mostly finished, I'm gonna go in with a mix here of cerulean blue and lunar black. I really like using lunar black because it is extremely granulating. I wanted to have some fun with the background here. I don't wanna to put too much on, but I wanna give Leo a little something to stand on. So still using that uh, Cosmotop Mix B and uh, going in and just creating a little bit of the shadow side first. And then we'll go in and add some more of this dark around here. And you can just see um, how I go around the entire subject to create this element of a background, keeping it darkest at the areas where it would be casting a shadow from Leo. So let me just speed this part up a little bit and um, we'll come back to the final details. Now on your background, you can use whatever you like. Um, I just really like this lunar black because I wanted to give it the opportunity to granulate. Now I will be the first to admit on this particular paper, I'm not expecting anything great. I just wanted something that would look fun with a lot of uh, random texturized brush strokes. And because I really like those modeled backgrounds for uh, pet portraits or human portraits for that matter. So that's what I tried to do here. And um, I kind of like the way that it came out. You could use any paint that you like like for your background and uh, cast any shadow, put your dog in any setting that you like. Whatever works for you, I'm drying this thoroughly and kind of making sure that I've got the back of it dry as well. Making some final assessments on Leo's right eye here, I really don't like that area where the fur is laying in front of his eye and the eye is still visible underneath that little piece of fur. If you look at the reference photo, you can catch that. Um, that little piece of fur always sticks up in front of his eye, so I kind of wanted to catch it, but I think I'm just going to rub it in and just kind of make that part of the just the overall lay of his fur. We'll just have uh, the curvature of the fur coming up over his eye instead of one piece of fur laying in front of his eye, if that makes sense. Wanted to correct that a little bit. And now I'm going to go in with this uh, long point round again and just really kind of um, add in a little bit of definition to some hairs here and there on Leo's fur just to try and give it, once again, a little bit more personality. 
So coming into the home stretch here, I do want to mention um, highlights in eyes. They're never identical. If you have a highlight on one eye and then you have another highlight in the other eye, they're not going to be identical in shape. So you can see with these, I've really kind of made them uh, just slightly shaped differently. And I'm going in and lifting off because I did paint in those highlights as cerulean blue because what they're going to be reflecting is the sky. Uh, but I didn't want to have it quite that much reflected. And here you can see I'm working on with the nose where I'm uh, going in and lifting off and then using that paper towel to blot off even more of the pigment. And we're just going to go back in and kind of fill this in a little bit. And I think I'm still just kind of working with this nose. Let me show you the final result of how it ended up. Here is the shape that I finally settled on and I've got a little bit of water sitting on there where I wanted to lift some off and now I'm going in with a folded corner of that towel and really pressing firmly to get that highlight in. And now I think we're good. Let's go ahead and add the details onto the scarf. So many things you can use to do this. I started off with a white gel, plant, gel pen and I just wasn't feeling it so I'm switching over to this paint pen which I really like. This paint pen is more of an enamel. It's kind of an oil-based paint, um, which will come in handy later. And this wasn't planned, but it worked out to be quite a good benefit that I was happy that I used this paint pen. Um, it's fine point paint pen. You can use whatever you like. A colored pencil you can use. You can use a pastel pencil. Um, for the next step though, I do paint over this a little bit. I put another wash on here and add some shading to the scarf. So the pastel pencil, you might want to wait until you're absolutely completely done before you put that one in. But the colored pencil should work as a resist if you wanted to. Uh, so let's go ahead to the end of this little process and I'll show you where I put in the shading on the scarf. When you're done, you want to make sure that all the white is completely dry. And if you do it in this order that I chose to do it in here, why I don't know I could have done this before <laughs> but if you do do it in this order where you put on the shadows after uh, just make sure that everything is completely dry I went in with the shadow color of the uh, quinacridone rose mixed with the cerulean blue because that scarlet Holbein the Holbein scarlet lake is so warm I, I didn't want to uh, create kind of a muddy purple I really wanted that luminescence in the purple and quinacridones are really great for mixers in that way so I'm just going in with a little bit, a very thin wash of the quinacridone rose mixed with the, uh, the, the cerulean blue there. And then I am uh, added a little touch more blue to it to get the darker lines in from the folds in his little kerchief. And you can see as I'm painting over the white, it's not really sticking to it. That's what I mean by, um, that's why I was able to do this now is because uh, you can really see it here when I go on this left side with the Scarlet Lake that uh, it just kind of doesn't stick to that paint pen and creates a resist. So obviously if you're using a pastel pencil, which is chalk, it would just smear that. But uh, a colored pencil, if you've got colored pencil on there, that should work. And I'm just going to lift that off a little bit. And then let's go ahead and get this dry. And then I think we're going to be all finished with our little Leo. And finally, now that it is dry and all of the color shifts are complete, I'm just going to brighten up some of these little notes here on his kerchief. Now, if you didn't want to decorate the kerchief for Valentine's Day, you wouldn't have to. Um, you could just put a plain color kerchief on your pet or leave it off. This is, of course, an embellishment and it's completely up to you. You'll notice in the original photo, I didn't include the tags that are just off on his left shoulder. I didn't include those that uh, are on his collar. Um, but you could put the tags in on the collar as well if you wish. Whatever you like to do, it's your pet, your painting. Really take the time to personalize it and uh, make it something that you're going to enjoy because you're doing this for yourself. As I'm looking over for final touches, I noticed I wanted to add a couple more little highlights in his eyes. And you'll notice, once again, I did not do those evenly. There's a little bit more on his right eye than there are on the left. And now I'm going to go ahead and touch in a few highlights on the nose. And look what you can do here. You can touch this in with a paint pen or uh, a gel pen and then use your finger to just kind of blot it a little bit. And that'll really soften it. You can go around the nostrils this way too and really just make a nice soft white glow. And that way it won't stick out quite as prominently. It won't be a super high highlight, but it will definitely give the exact glow that you're looking for in your painting. Remember to sign your work. I always encourage everyone to sign and date their work because this is your diary. This is your journal, your memory of where you are as an artist, the history that you're building, and uh, a very important part of your creative life. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. I hope you really enjoyed painting Leo with me. And um, if you wanted to paint your own pet, of course, feel free to do that. We'll see you next week, everybody. 
have a wonderful creative time. Bye now.